Hello, this is Christian Okoye, a former Kansas City Chiefs. You are listening to Brilliant Truth. Everybody, to the Grueling Truth NFL Legend Show brought to you by Replenishing Care Technologies and Gridiron Mo. Make sure you check both of those websites out, which you can find on the GruelingTruth.net. You'll be able to find both of their banners. Click that, check them out. I'm your host, as normal for the Legend Show, Mike Goodpaster. And tonight we have a special guest, and we've been doing the Legend Show for a year, and we had our first kicker last night, former Cincinnati Bengal Jim Breach. We got our second kicker tonight. And he was kicked for the Dallas Cowboys, was a Super Bowl champion, Super Bowl twelve, then later went on to star for the Seattle Seahawks. Help me welcome to the show former two time Pro Bowl kicker, Efren Herrera. How you doing, Efren? Doing great, thank you. I really appreciate this opportunity to maybe talk to some of these uh, fans that might remember some of the stuff I used to do. Yeah, I mean, the stuff I remember mainly was in Seattle with Jack Patera and all the fake field goals and stuff, but we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, we'll start off, you grew up in Mexico. I know you ended up being on the second Mexican player or Mexican-born player ever in the NFL. Tell us what it was like your time growing up in Mexico, and then I think you moved to the States when you were a teenager, and how you discovered the game of football. You know, it's, it's really funny. Life has its turns. Uh, I came up here, I'm one of the only players that I think of, uh, I came without thinking about sports. I came up here because I wanted to be, to go to school. And, uh, you know, my sister was going on vacation and she didn't even know. I went and find out what is it that I needed to come down to, to the United States as a student because I, went, I thought I was working and I was going to school in Mexico. And I asked my sister, is it true that it's free to go to school in high school in, in the uh, California? And she said, yeah. And then I asked her, can I come? She said, well, we only, I only have 10 days. And I said, well, if I get, uh, if I get a, my papers, can I come? And she said, yeah. So then I asked her to come over to the uh, American Embassy, and uh, we went over, and uh, they told me, okay, I need a sponsor. And there was, she had a home. She was married, and, and thanks to my sister, I came to the States, and I came to, to go to school, nothing else. And then coming over, uh, I went in. Uh, we, uh, we have a home in West Covina, and I came over. I went to uh, West Covina High School for three days, and, and then they finally, they thought that maybe I should go and, and get a special program, which was on La Puente. It was four and a half miles away. Are you still there? Yes. Anyway, so, so that's how it started. But just going to school, nothing else. And I walked four and a half miles every day in the morning and uh, at nighttime. And by accident, I was discovered. Uh, sometimes it's free and... And something about about things you do. Uh, it, it, when I came here in 1967, and they had, it used to be United States used to have uh, some sort of uh, coordination on the whole country about the uh, the condition of the sophomores, and physical condition. They used to do a lot of things. They used to do sit-ups and push-ups. And, yeah, wasn't that like, wasn't that started by President Kennedy? Right, like the fitness test or something. I think they still did it like in the seventies when I was in junior or when I was in elementary and junior high. And, and, and thanks to that, you know, I didn't speak English, and I ran the mile, and I ran it pretty well. And uh, and then the coach, whoever was doing that, didn't believe that I did it well. He thought that I ran only three three laps. So the coach told me, said by the fingers, said not three. You got to do four, and I said I did four, and 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 he couldn't understand me. So then I took off again. <laughs> I went around another mile, and when I the first mile that I ran, it was five. I think it was five fifty, some almost six six minutes a mile, and uh, uh, and no, almost five minutes. And so then second mile I ran, and I ran it about maybe four seconds a little bit slower. So then the coach, uh, he said, you want to you wanna go for cross, cross country? And I said, sure. I didn't even know what it was. <laughs> and, uh, 
<clears throat> and I show up at three o'clock and and I started running. And uh, we had I had a guy, a friend of mine, who was in the team, and he would tell me how far we were going because I didn't know we have hills here in uh, in uh, in the. Uh, 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 east of LA, there is uh, a nice resort. It's called the uh, the Palms and uh, and City of Industry. That used to be hills, and we used to run. And uh, I used to run, and I was in the cross country team. And then one day, the uh, the coach was sick, and so the assistant coach came over, and we used to run every day in the hills five miles. And for some reason, the guy said, just run a mile on the track. And we ran it, and we looked at each other. We're fresh. And so one of them said, you know, if we had a soccer ball, uh, it would be really great. We get. And I said, you know, we didn't have a soccer ball. So I went over, and I jumped the fence, and I went and got a basketball. I mean, you're not supposed to kick the basketball. You're yeah. not supposed to play with it. And so we started playing, and then one of the kids said, Efren, you know, when I was in, in, in Mexico, I used to be a, a, a really good goalie. So I said, okay, why don't you get up there? In the... And in high school, if you remember, I don't, know if I don't know if I still have it. I think they do. The goalpost, the bottom is like a soccer goalpost, a little yeah. bigger. And, and so he, he st- I started hitting it to him, and he couldn't stop any because I was hitting it too hard. And at that time, the head coach of uh, La Puente uh, saw me and he blew the whistle and called us in. And he said, were you the guy who was hitting it? I said, no, I wasn't. And so he said, tell him that he's not in trouble. And I said, if I'm not in trouble, yeah, if I'm not in trouble, yeah, that was me. So he said, yeah, he said, you want to you wanna, you wanna hit some footballs? I didn't know anything about football. I never seen a football. I never seen those kind of footballs. So I said, yeah. So he went and got seven balls. And at that time, uh, my friend who, who spoke both English and Spanish, he had to go. And uh, everybody left. And here's this guy, Mike Quinn, the head coach of La Puente High School, and myself by ourselves. And so he put one down, and I hit it in the corner. In the corner, at the bottom of that little, little, little entrance there, I hit it nice, and he looked at me kind of like saying, you know, that wasn't very good. So I said, I'm going to choose the other corner, and I hit it the other corner. And then he stopped and he said, "Tell me, not there." He wanted me to go up, but he didn't know he didn't know how to say it. So yeah. eventually, he came up with the word alto. So I looked and I said, "There." He said, "Yeah." So I kicked all the way to the 47. I never missed one. So then he said, okay, you're going to play football. And I told him, no, 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 I can't play football. So why? He, and I showed him, I said, you know, number one in cross country. So he looked at me and, you know, for some reason, sometimes you learn the bad words first. So I couldn't understand when he said that cross country was not for, you know, just for, they were not for man. It was for more for and and he, and I told him, I said, well, football is for me. He said, yeah, well, then where do I sign? And I started playing. And that's right, how now, I did you, I mean, since you were such a good athlete, did you play any position other than kicker on your high school team? You know, when I, when I used to kick off, I, I didn't know much about it, but they just told me, go get the guy who was going to carry the ball. So I'll be the first guy to go up there and make it a tackle. I would go up there, and I love contact. And so... I started, and, and when when they asked me to go play, they asked my sister Delia, uh, that, and he, she said, no, he can't play because I was only 142 at that time, 142 pounds. So he said, no, he's too small. They said, no, no, he's just going to be a kicker in our team. So they they thought, and he said, what are we going to do with that for now? And then they mentioned, he said, well, we didn't tell her that he could play in the JVs. So what they did is uh, they they told me to come and play on Monday with the JVs, and uh, I got in there, and I, I was a linebacker, and all of a sudden, you know, I see the line, a defensive line, all in three-point stands. So my first play, I, I was in a three-point stand linebacker. And everybody kept looking at me, so telling me to get out. No, no, Evan. And I said, no, no, they're all down, the guys in front of me. And, and my, my whole responsibility is they told me, he said, now listen, when the quarterback gets the ball, you go get him. 
If you give it to somebody, you go get them. So all I did is just go get whoever has the ball. And I had a great time, and I enjoyed it. And then I played, you know, I played all the sports there. And, and eventually uh, I had a lot of scholarships. You know, the, the coach the coach that I played with, Mike Quinn, right away he kind of knew that, that I was a good athlete and that I was I was going to be a pretty good a, a, a student. Well, so here, he, not that, not, I don't mean to interrupt you, but my question would be this. You came here as a teenager then, I take it, 14 or 15. 15. Did it, do, you, do you think that it made the transition easier because you were a good athlete? No question. No, no question because my whole, like I mentioned, all I wanted to do is go to school. And when, as soon as that happened and the coach, Mike Quinn, came to me, he said, listen, Evan, you know, I can get your scholarship anywhere you want to go as long as you give me the grades. So we shook hands. You know, I mean, when I grew up, we shook hands, and that was like signing a contract. I said, are you sure? He said, yeah, okay. And I started going to school. I used to go to summer school. I used to go everywhere because I wanted to go to school. Remember, my goal was to come here to go to school, nothing else. And my sister to make sure that I was going to do that because she never let me work. She said, no, you're going to just go to school. You go to school and give me the best grades. And, and I tried everything, and I worked real hard the summer. I used to go every summer to get a, a little advanced because, because I had to learn the language, which it was going to be hard to go to, to a school. And so yeah. I went on, and when I was, uh, I was a good student, and when I was a senior, I, I passed my SAT, and I went, you know, barely, but I made it. And I tell my son, I say, you know, probably today I won't be able to go to school because of my grade point average was 3.3. I said, no, you need better grace than that. But but that's what happened. And then Mike Quinn, he got, I mean, he got just about every university in the country. You name it, Alabama. I mean, I got recruited by everybody. And uh, there was a, a man who was recruiting me for UCLA. His name is Dick Vermeil. And uh, we, were, we were real high on him. And I could have gotten a lot of different schools, but... You know, he said, you know, friend, this will be good because you're close home and uh, and you'll be able to see your family and you'll be playing in a great team, a good, you know, a good program. And, and that's how we went. I went to UCLA with the idea of uh, playing football and playing soccer because I, I, was a, I was a better soccer player than a football player. And so UCLA say yes, as long as you play football first, and then you don't play soccer at all when you're in the season of football, and it's at the same time, soccer and football. And then as soon as we got out of football, even if we have to play, like I got out of football on Saturday, and sometimes we might have a game on, sa- on Sunday because we had a great team at UCLA, and I will go and start for the varsity at UCLA. And uh, thank God, I mean, in my last two years, we went all the way to the finals of the NCAA soccer team. And, and so that's how, you know, I, I went to UCLA because I wanted to play soccer. And then when I, I was through with soccer, when I was through at UCLA, they wanted me to play soccer. Mexico wanted me to go to Mexico and play. And here the Aztecs wanted me to play here. And uh, I decided to go to, uh, to football because we, at that time, at that time, at that particular time, there wasn't any Hispanics playing football. And I thought it would be great to maybe perhaps if I make it, it will be, you know, mention Hispanic names and maybe uh, other, other kids will, will kind of, you know, think that It'll they can make it easier on kids. other people, basically. Right. And, and that's how, you know, uh, you know, Max Montoya, Andrew Munoz, uh, Rivera, they all came in, you know, right after that. And uh, and thank God we we have a lot of representation uh, in the NFL. All right, so you got drafted in '74 by Detroit. Uh, right. Like you said, you were the second Mexican American born player ever drafted in the NFL. I think Tom Fears was the first, wasn't he? Right. And but the problem was you get way before the season started. Uh, right. The Cowboys signed you a few games into '75, but what was your mindset like when you got waived by Detroit? It's an interesting time, you know. Um, 
I, I, before he, I, I had a problem. There was a, it was a, a coach named uh, Rick Forsano, and he was the assistant coach there. I was drafted by McCaffrey, uh, and uh, he was real high on me. In fact, when McCaffrey was there, I even had a, a show uh, for our fans. I went up there and kicked. Uh, he, he showcased me. And uh, and and uh, I went and played, and uh, everything was good. And then what so happened? Uh, McCaffrey passed away, and Rick Forsano had a son. Uh, his name was Rick, Rick Forsano, or a junior. And so, the, for some reason, the kid and I we hit it off. So he was always with me. The kid was always with me, and uh, and and it got a conflict. It was a conflict because, uh, you know, the kid had long hair, and uh, Rick, for some reason, he was very disciplined, and, and so he always made fun of the kid. And the kid always come, came to me. And so uh, 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 my roommate was cut, and, and Rick Jr. asked his father if he could come and stay with me. And he asked me, I said, sure. And then he stayed with me, and I, I, I used to cut hair for kids that don't have any money. So some of the rookies have cut hair for them. And and uh, Rick Jr. saw that, so he asked me to cut his hair because he wanted to, you know, surprise his father because he always makes fun of him. And uh, I did that. I cut his eyes and everything, and the next day we come over, and, and he saw him with his hair cut, and so the father would ask him to cut his hair. He never wanted to do it. And then he did it with me. It got a big problem between us. And, uh, and, you know, the first time he saw him, he said, Ricky, what happened to your beautiful hair? And I told him, I said, Rick, I said, this kid cannot please you. He said, no, he did this for you, and uh, here you are complaining. And he just said, well, you know, and I said, anyway, so we kind of hit it off bad. And when McCaffrey yeah. passed away, guess who became the head coach? Yeah. Rick Forsano. And yeah. so... I'm there, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he put me on waivers, and I don't even know. We won the last, almost the last, the second to the last exhibition game, we went to Buffalo and to play against O.J. Simpson. And I'm getting dressed, and Rick comes over, and he said, Efren, you can't get dressed. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I'll put you on waivers, so you won't be able to play for this game. And I told him, I said, what's waivers? He said, well, I just wanted to test your value. And I didn't know. And so then I kind of didn't like it. You know, because I'm not playing. And this guy took me there. And then when I came home, there were three calls on my phone. The Cowboys, 49ers, and the Rams. And they all wanted to talk to me. And so uh, I got really nervous because I didn't know what the hell was going on. <laughs> and, and, and what happened is Rick Fursano was pissed at me. And and so then I realized, so I told him, I don't want to sign the contract. I said, I'm not signing. He said, sign because you're going to be playing with us. I said, no, I don't like it. I said, I, and I told him, I said, I don't trust you. And uh, we had a little a little situation because of his son and the son being with me, carrying my shoes and everything. And, uh, and then finally uh, uh, they convinced me to play the last game against Oakland. We playing there, and uh, and and then I went and played, and and I I don't think I missed a field goal. I don't think I, and uh, and then they uh, Rick Sanatoli said, well, if you're if you on Tuesday if we don't call you, you means you made the team because Tuesday is when they make the cuts, and it was a, it was a, it was the first game that we we're gonna be you know regular NFL team, and the the guy who was a really good guy with me and, and most of the players. They all wanted me to be there. They knew that I was going to be, you know, that I was going to be really good. And uh, but Steve Owens was the Heisman Trophy from Oklahoma, yeah. and Steve Owens and I we were really close to each other, and we hit it off. And he always called me Biggie, hey Biggie, and so we hung around together. And when this thing happened on Tuesday, they didn't call me, so I thought I made the team. I mean, now, you know, and so I came, I came, I went over on Wednesday and, uh, and I'm getting ready to go to a practice and I'm getting re uh, dressed and coach Forsano came over and said, I'm sorry, Efren, but you won't be able to play for us. I said, what do you mean? 
He said, well, we just cut you. I said, no, no. I said, the cut was yesterday. And uh, he didn't cut me. He said, yeah, but we, we asked permission for the NFL, and they gave it to us with one play, and it was you. And we made a decision that, that you're, gonna, you know, you're not going to be in this team. So I looked at him, and I said, you know, Rick, I said, I don't know what happened, and I don't have any idea because I'm a player. I said, but our path is going to cross again. And when we cross again, you're going to see the difference of who you are and who I am. And I said, thank you anyway, and I, le- and, and I went home. It was Wednesday. And, and when I got home, the cop was calling uh, Gil Brand called me. He said, Efren, he said, what happened? I said, I don't know. He said, so I see that you're released. Unfortunately, we already picked up our kicker. You know, Coach Slater was real high with uh, this kicker from uh, Texas, and he was in Chicago. And he said, but anyway, I said, I'm going to have a tryout uh, with a few players, a few kickers. Uh, and the tryout is Friday. Friday at 9 o'clock in the morning. I'm in Detroit, and this is Wednesday. I pack, I mean, I just bought a TV. I put it, I had a little car from Corolla, and I put all the stuff. I couldn't even recline back, and I, I went driving straight to Texas without stopping. And I got to Texas at 6 o'clock in the morning on Friday. And I went and checked in, in my hotel, took a shower and everything, and I show up, and uh, there were three kickers there. It was, uh, let me see, Bob Thomas, who played for the Chicago Bears, myself. Yeah. And there's a little kid who went to Houston. But anyway, they were there, and I beat them both, and, uh, and I stayed there. And uh, uh, the Cowboys decided, you know, that I was good enough to stay, and, and so they decided to, to pay me while I stay there, my contract. And uh, everything was great. And uh, I would go every day, but, but I, was kicking, I was kicking pretty well, and I could see that I could help the Cowboys. I could see that it was, and so I decided, you know, after the, I think the third game, the, they lost. If you, if you look at it in the schedule, I think if you're, you're going to see that. The Cowboys didn't win a game for, I think, three, three games they lost in a row. And, uh, and I thought, I said, you know what? I got to go talk to Coach Landry. Because they told me the coach, the coach didn't believe in rookies. And so I went and, and uh, I got into the office and uh and Coach Land received me, he said, Okay, what can I help you with? I said, Look, I don't f I don't want you to feel that I'm ungrateful. I know you pay me and I'm going to practice every day and uh but I feel that I could help you. I said, Bob Thomas was here, the other kid was here. If you see my stats, I said I'm I'm pretty good. And and I believe I can play in the NFL. And so he looked at me and said, so you think you can play in the NFL? I said, yeah. He said, okay. So he got the phone and called the secretary and told me that, told her that, that I'm, I'm leaving. I'm going home. And he sent me home. And I came home, and uh, I came, and my coach from high school, my Quinn was uh, coaching at Glendora, so he said, well, you can come in and you can, you're a good athlete and you can teach a lot of stuff, so you can come in, and, but you're going to play. So he went, and I, I went to Glendora for, I think, uh, about a week, and, uh, and then the 49ers and the Rams, they called me, and I, I, I set up an appointment for, to go to the 49ers on Monday and Tuesday, which is a day off, I was going to try out for the Rams, and and uh, I was so sad to, to do that. And then on Sunday, the Cowboys lose again. And when they, lo- they lost, they called me up and they told me, they said, you know, we want you to come and, and play next week. And that's how, you know, a lot of people think that it's real easy. My experience were really difficult. I was, yeah. you know, the highest, highest kicker drafted with Detroit, and I did real well in Detroit. And I did an exhibition for our fans with McCafferty, and and things happen sometimes that you cannot, you cannot, uh, you know, you cannot help it. And so, but I always have believed. I always thought, and I tell people when I go talk to them, I said the the line between succeeding and not succeeding is so thin that you could be either side sometimes and, and if you're not, you know, if you don't put yourself into whatever you want to do 100% and do it and do it and have faith on it, you know, you will never make it. And so 
that's how I started playing for the uh, Cowboys. And I, you, you played for Tom Landry, who's a legendary coach. We right. all know that every coach deals with his kickers a little bit different. Um, right. What was your relationship with Coach Landry like? You see, my relationship with coaches, most of the coaches, Coach Landry, I, when I got there, you know, and I went and, you know, I went and knocked on his office again. And I got in and I said, Coach, I only want to come and tell you that I'm going to bleed, I'm going to sweat, I'm going to do everything as possible to win. And I know that I can help you, and we're going to win. And so he just kind of, you know, he knew we had such a relationship that we even had commercials that we did together. He didn't do a lot of commercials because, and but his family, all his family, they all I had a restaurant, and they all came to my restaurant. I knew Junior, I knew the wife, um, Miss kind of Alicia Landry. I mean, I knew everybody there, and uh, and the coach and I, we were just so close. You know, we were so close. If you look at the when we come in in the, in the stadium, you know, I got embarrassed sometimes because I, I, he always wanted me to, he always asked for me when we come into the stadium. And he said, where's Saffron? And then, and then you know, Charlie Wallace, Good Harris, all those guys, they will kick me in the butt. He said, you know he's going to call on you. You get up in the front. And and then I will go up there as the coach. He said, okay, I'll finally lead us. And you see, when I, we come in, I was always leading. Yeah. And for some reason, we hit it off. It was just such a great relationship between Coach Landry and myself. He never asked me for anything. He never did. You know, Charlie, Charlie Waters and myself, everybody. I mean, I got along with everybody. It was just a, a they, they kind of, I, I was like a player. I was a very good athlete. And I used to lift weights with, uh, with uh, linebackers. And I used to run cross country, you know, anything about one mile, nobody could beat me. I don't care who it was. And so I was always a team player. I, I was never kind of like, they never recognized me just as a kicker. I will go up there in the field and I will look at the films and I check and see and I'll be kind of the skeleton. If the defense is going to be doing something, I'll be like maybe a running back making moves. The running back for the other team that we're going to be playing, I will see him in the film and I will give him a picture. And so I was always with the players. I was never considered to be a kicker. And Charlie Waters, you know, we used to go and play racquetball and had a lot of fun. And uh, Charlie Waters always thought because he was such a great athlete, you know, and I come up with some things. Uh, I, I would come up with a fake field goal, and, 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 and he said, you know, if we we'll do this, I think it would be great because you're a good athlete. And so we decided one time to test it. I think we were playing Houston, and uh and we needed two yards. And so Charlie goes up there to Coach Landy. He said, you know, if we do the option to Efren, I, th- I think we can make the first down. And everything was wor- going okay. And we did the play, and I'm supposed to run to the side. And he, he threw it to me because Charlie, Charlie Water was a quarterback at Clemson. And yeah. he threw it to me on the side, and the safety recognized the play. And he came after me. You know, they're really fast. This, a lot of people don't realize how fast the players are, especially defensive backs. Yeah, you know, like high school or even college. Oh, no way. No, no. This guy's are lining fast. And, yeah. and I'm, yeah, I'm running to get the two yards. And the guy is coming. The only good thing is at that time, some of those guys, they were not that big. They, they yeah. were, you know. And so I ran, and we hid, and I went ahead, and I made the first down. And and Charlie Water, Charlie Water was and I, Charlie was saying, yeah, Efren. And he goes up to Coach Landry. He said, hey, Coach, you see, I told you. And he looked at me. He said, Never again. <laughs> never. And with the Cowboys, I never did another fake field goal or an onside kick because we didn't need it. But then when I went to UCLA, I mean, I went to the uh, to the Seahawks. Then, oh, yeah, you know, part of the I, offense in Seattle, effort. Well, because because I wanted to win. Sometimes the players that want to win, you see, I could have a longer career, but I have both knees. You know, they got, I got hurt, but I wanted to win. I, I thought my time that I was going to be there, I, I had a short time to prove that I was a winner, and so. 
And no matter what, even when I went to Seattle, if you look at the record and everything, Seattle is a, a two-year uh, old extension team, and they had only won five games. And the four games uh, that they, they had, it was against Tampa Bay. Tampa Bay had never won in two, in two years. And so they yeah. played them twice. And so they won all four, and I think we beat another team when I got there. Uh, and when I got there, we just we didn't have that great of a team compared to the Cowboys. So we had to do all kinds of fake field goals, onside kicks. I mean, everybody thought they were kind of like a goofy place, but they were playing. You see, I put them all together with Rusty Tillman. Rusty Tillman was a really great coach, and, and he believed in what I wanted to do. And so I would show them different things, and then we go on the field, and we're executing against a defense without them knowing. And every time it worked. And uh, so, so Jack, you know, when we have plays, we usually have two different plays that were good. And then I go and I ask him. I say, Jack, I think right now is a good time to do the onside kick or a good time to do the fake field goal. And he would look at me and he said, do you think it's going to work? I said, oh, he said, it better. And it always worked because it was a play. It was not – a goofy thing. It was we plan. I plan everything. I can see reaction. I see how everything's going to work and how it's going to be open. How the the, the stage is going to cover you know a certain part of the field or, and and the uh, the tight ends can come out and release either inside or outside. And one of these is back to all go with them. And so we kind of had a plan. And every time we did, for some reason, they all worked. Everything worked. At one time, I was a blocker, and another time, another time, I I I I spread to the side like a like a like a like a receiver, and 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 so the team was so confused of the defense, and they're looking and they're all saying, uh, "Effort is going to get the ball." Effort is going. So I I was I was the first kicker ever to be double team, <laughs> double. <laughs> Go on coverage. <laughs> and, well, you were a think, huge fan favorite in Seattle, too, which had oh, to make you feel good. Most I, I people love just it. complain about the kickers. Oh, I love Seattle. You know, at one time they put yeah. a little special in there. He said, you better come early to the game because it could be something, it could happen something that you will miss. And that's because one time I opened up a game with an onside kick and we got, and we got it. So we had a lot of fun in Seattle. We had some. We didn't have a great team, but we could beat anybody. Yeah, we could do all kinds well, of. You guys stuff. shocked a lot of teams that you, those years, and I mean, you guys were fun to watch. I, I think you know, almost every time they put you guys on Monday Night Football, it seemed like there was a fake field goal or a fake punt involved with it. Well, that's what happened the first time we were on Monday Night Football. Uh, you know, Howard Cassell went crazy. You know, we're in, in we're in Atlanta, and uh, we had a fake field goal, and, and it yeah, was that was the 1979 game, wasn't it? Right, and yeah. um, the first time we ever played, uh, we ever played uh, in, in national TV, and and I we ran the fake field goal, and, and I went out, and 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 uh, Jim Zone passed me the ball, and I got the ball, and I went all the way to about the five yard line, and and it so happened, the game was real close. It was a very close game, and this thing kind of just kind of made give us the advantage, and, and we won, I think, I think we won 17-14 or something. I mean, it was just, it, it was a real close game, and Howard Gasol was just going crazy and the, and the, and the, and the uh, TV, and, and he's talked about me, and, and then we became real good friends where he would call me once in a while and talk to me about different things. And, and when I went to New York, I got a chance to meet his wife and uh, his daughter. I mean, it was just I, – I had some great, great experience playing. And uh, it so happened that my, my career was short, but not necessarily because I, was, I, couldn't, I couldn't play anymore because as far as I can tell, and, uh, you know, I, I'm sure everybody feels that way, but – I don't think they ever beat me, uh, you know, to uh, for the position. It's just that I was uh, when when I was with the Cowboys, uh, uh, you know, I, I was a promise by hand with Coach uh, with uh, Ted Sram, 
And uh, they pay me, if you look back, and because everything is there, I was the worst pay kicker in the league for the, last, for the first four years with the Cowboys. In the first two years, I took it okay because I, I wanted to play. I knew that the Cowboys was going to have a great team. And, and so after, after my second year, I, I was considered to be one of, a pretty good kicker, and, and I'm still the lowest paid kicker. And uh, they gave me a contract for two years. Uh, Coach Land, I mean Coach uh, Tex Ram, and uh, typical, typical at that time that we believe, and you know Tex Ram kind of liked it. We shook hands, on, and he said, "If you make all pro, I'll pay us an all pro." And, and I said, "Okay." I said, "Give me the contract that I don't want to sign." I said, "I'm going to sign this because I'll see you in two years, uh, uh, Mr. Shram. And I shook hands and I said, "Okay." Okay, when I come up here, uh, you pay me as uh, what I'm worth. I'll please approve it. And so he said, okay. And he said, in fact, I'll tell you how I feel about this team. I said, the next two years, we don't win a Super Bowl. You don't have to pay me. Even though I'll be the best kicker, you don't have to pay me as the best kicker. And we shook hands. And when you shook I I'm the type. You know, I learned the hard way, but I shook hands with him. And two years later, I'm the best kicker. I'm the all-pro. I'm the leading scorer. We went to the Super Bowl. We beat Denver 27 to 10. And, and so I was real happy. And I, always, I wanted to finish. I had business in Dallas. I had a restaurant, and I created a, 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 some sort of a radio station that I created with another, another person and called Servicio Informativo en Español. And so we did shows, and I, I did – I got – if I tell the types in my house and I, I traduce, I, I, I get everything in Spanish and I'll be doing, so I was doing great. I never, ever, ever charge one penny for any appearance. I would always go to every, anybody invite me to anything, I will always go. In fact, I, I used to, Braniff was our, our, our airlines, and so I would talk to Braniff if I had to go to Boutique, Texas, or whatever. Every little place in Texas, if they call me and they want me to go up there and, and visit them, I would go. And and I go to Brandon and I ask him for I get a license, send me a letter. And so they send me a letter, I take it to him, I say, I need to get to San Antonio. And they'll give me a free uh, a free ticket. Yeah. And I go there, and uh, I never charge. I know something because I always felt the fans pay my salary. I never thought that Cowboys were paying me. I always thought yeah. if it wasn't for them to show up for the game or they watch the TV and watch us play, we would not make this kind of money. And even though it was not super, super money, but it was really good money. And so I was really grateful. And uh, and, and then when Tex Ram uh, – Back on from his uh, word, you know, I couldn't take it. Uh, and he knew that I, I had a restaurant and I was doing pretty well. And he knew that I had the other business. And so, but but the pride that I have as a man shaking hands with someone and, and he broke his promise, it just, it just killed me. It killed yeah, me. And especially with the success you had. I mean, back-to-back Pro Bowls, I think it was, 77, yeah, 78. Yeah, you yeah, no, no. 77, and then on yeah. top of it, they send you to an expansion team. And and, 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 and so, you know, and, and he told me, you know, Tex uh, Shrine told me, he said, you signed, it was a five-year contract. And what I did, which I thought, because I wanted to stay with the Cowboys, I took him five salaries from kickers, from kickers. And I told him, I said, here's the, the five uh, top players, paid players, kickers. Why don't you average it so when you talk to the media, because I knew the Cowboys were not paying really well. I think at that time they were kind of like third wor- worst team pay in the league. And But, but we love to play because we were going to win. We we're Americans' team. So everybody kind of like wanted to stay there. And I wanted to stay there. But – yeah, it wasn't like there was free agency where all of a sudden the Pittsburgh Steelers could offer you $5 million a year. Exactly. And the problem was that he broke his, his promise. And when I didn't care, I mean, I didn't care when he broke his promise and I was shaking hands and everything, I feel so devastated that, you know, here I am. I've done everything I could. We have won, and I knew we had a team to continue winning and everything. And 
and and uh, this man backs out from his um, from his shaking hand, and I I couldn't stand it. And he told me, he said, sign this contract or you won't play in the NFL. And at that time, Tesson was the most powerful man in the NFL. He was the most yeah. powerful. We had our we had a guard, Blaine Knight, uh, who was a guard, and he was I think he was a second team all pro, and he wanted to be traded to the 49ers because he went to Stanford and he wanted to get PhDs. He was a, he was a brilliant guy, and uh, and Tesson put him in the closet. He never played again, and he didn't care. He went to he went to uh, uh, San Francisco, and and he became a, a real you know. I think he got two PhDs, and and he was really he's very smart, and uh, and he didn't care. Well, I care, and I wanted to stay there, but I couldn't stay there, and so so you know, uh, uh, Coach Sandy and I were so close. He told me if you don't sign this contract, you will never play another down in the NFL. And I believe him. So I went to Coach Landry, and, and I told him, like, the first day that I went up there, I told him that I could play and I could help him, and he sent me home. I went in, and I told him, Coach, I said, you know, I am in trouble. He said, listen, I know this term is real hard to negotiate, but you have to get a contract because without you, we will not make the NFL, we will not make the Super Bowl again. I said, you're a very vital part, but it's hard, but try it, you know, because you deserve it. And I said, well, I can't do it. You know, I can't do it because uh, uh, he broke his promise, and, and it was just between him and I, and, and I, I can't play here anymore. I would love to play for you. And I said, but I couldn't, I could not play for, for Ted Slam. And so he said, what do you want me to do? I said, you know, if I've done anything for you, if you think, I said, I'd be grateful if you can trade me. So I keep playing. I said, I'm, I'm a very young man, and I got a lot of a lot of spunk on me. I still have, you know, I'm, I know I'm going to be all pro. I'll be one of the best in the league. And he says, you know, everybody's going to miss you, I think. Because without you, we went up won a Super Bowl. And uh, the next day, he trained me to Seattle. His friend trained me to Seattle to bury me. So all the players could see that this could happen to you. And, and unfortunately, you know, for me, fortunately, is that I started playing and 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 my name was still up. I was still considered one of the best kickers in the league, even though I'm with Seattle. And then I started getting more publicity because of my fake field goals and onside kicks, and we started beating teams that nobody thought that we could beat. And, uh, and, and but... But sometimes you do things that whatever it takes to be able to win. And I always done things to win. I, I never went for second. I always wanted to be the best. And so when I was in Seattle, when I was in Seattle, you know, Coach, uh, Coach uh, uh, Patera, he called me and I said, listen, do you believe that I'm the best kicker in the league? And he said, yes, that's what we trade for you. And I said, do you think I can make your team to win? And he said, yeah, your leadership and everything. I, I, we, we scouted you and everything, and that's what we trade for you. He said, we don't have a team, but I know you could, you can make things happen. At least uh, there was one of the assistants on the management who knew me in Dallas, and he told me, he said, Efren is a winner. He wins. And he gets the teams together. You know, all the things, he works real hard. And, and so... You know, I told him, I said, you believe that? And he said, yeah. And he said, okay. He said, listen, I don't want any problems. I don't want people to think that I'm difficult. I'm really nice, easy to get along. I'm going to work real hard, harder than anybody's going to think. And I said, because I want to win. And he said, okay. And so I just asked him, he said, well, if you believe I'm the best, then pay me as the best in the league. And he said, yeah. So I started playing, and the Cowboys you know, all the players see me in Seattle, and, and they see that my life is still, I mean, my, my name is still up, and I'm making, you know, waves and everything, and Seattle started winning. The first time I went up there, even though they have won five games in two years, my first year, I think we won like seven, and we almost made the playoffs. We were looking at it, and so we started playing harder and harder, and uh, my last year almost made it. I mean, just to give you an idea how much I wanted to win so you understand this. It's, people don't understand. People say that they want to win. But 
1981, you know, we were about ready to maybe make the playoffs. We had two games to go in the season. And so I came, we came to San Diego to play San Diego. And, uh, uh, and I had a, a, a appendix attack at nighttime. And the, court, the doctor came because I said, you know, I don't get sick, something. And he checked it. He said, it's your appendix. And he said, what do you want to do? I said, what? To, I said, I want to play. And he said, okay. We'll get an emergency guy there ready for you, and we'll, make, we'll protect a little bit. And, and so I went in San Diego, and I think we won it with a field goal. And it was only one game left in the season, and it was Kansas City at home. And if we beat Kansas City, I think it was if Denver beats the Raiders, we'll be in the playoff for the first time in the history because we beat the Raiders twice during the season. They were in our, in our division. And so they asked me, said, what do you want to get surgery? I said, well, let's go to Seattle. And we went to Seattle, and at 1 o'clock, I see the doctor, and he said, well, we're going to operate. I said, doctor, is there any way you can go, you know, try not to cut too much of the muscle? And he said, what do you mean? I said, but uh, I want to play next week. He said, what? Yeah, I want to. He said, okay, this is what I'll do, Efren. He said, if anybody can do it, I know it's you. Because I know you, how much you want to win. I said, look, if we beat him, I explained to him what it was. He said, okay, I'm going to have surgery at 1 o'clock. At 6 o'clock, you get up and start walking, and I come and make my routes in the hospital, and I'll see you at 9 o'clock. And your knee has to be on your waist, high as the waist when you walk. And if you can do that, I think you have a chance. Because uh, the whole idea is the muscle goes into shock to protect your body, and that's how it takes a longer time because the muscle is still protecting the injury side. I said, if you do that, you kind of, you kind of, uh, uh, the muscle is not going to know how bad he is. And so I started doing that. And the next week, we went to play uh, uh, the the uh, uh, Kansas City, and I went and played. I could only kick to 45 yards field goals. And, and we won the game 10, 13 to 10 with a field goal. And we won it. Unfortunately, the Raiders beat the Denver, and, and they beat us for the playoffs. But that's sometimes how much you want to win. Yeah. I wanted to win. I wanted to. I mean, I, I just, they couldn't keep me off. I, I don't care if my, it was my knee or my, my anything. I would be there, and I would do the best I could. And yeah, that's don't you think I, that players back then, more guys were like you, and today maybe not so much? Well, I think, I think the business side came out. You know, the shaking hands, they were gone. People have bad ideas, but, I, you know, with, uh, with, uh, with, with the Cowboys, just to give you an idea how bad this thing worked out because, you know, I was really down, and I talked to Coach, I, I talked to Ted Swamp, and I was not afraid of him. I was dumb. I was stupid, and I was not afraid of him. I wanted to stay there, but I knew I couldn't stay there with, uh, w- with him lying to me. You know, when yeah. you lie to somebody, you can't, and he's a main guy there. And I couldn't go to the media and I couldn't do – when I left, look, when I left, I wanted my contract to be around $75,000. We put me with the other five guys you know, because they all make somewhere in there. And when I, the next day when he traded me, he said the reason we traded Efren is that Efren wanted our contract for $150,000 and we could not afford that. And there's nothing you can do. You can talk to the people. You can, I mean, I remember the people from Texas. You know, I used to go and, and do everything free, and, and kind of almost they hated me that I left because of money. Yeah. And they didn't realize. Yeah, the problem is, back then, the way it was, those teams basically owned you like property almost. Exactly. And they didn't realize, and they thought that all I want is money, even though I had not charged anything to anybody. I never charged a penny for a signature or anything, and uh, because I was, and that hurt me more than anything else. The my own people, the Mexican Americans, they believe that you know that I, all I wanted was money, and no, I wanted respect. 
I wanted to to be like everybody else and not to be a Mexican at that time and be the only the only Mexican there. And so I fought for my rights and of course eventually it pays off, but you make the sacrifice knowing that something is gonna to happen to you. And so so my career, you know, after I went I went from the Cowboys, I never got invited to anything with the Cowboys. You know, I don't know if you know but I had never gone back to the Cowboys, ever. Yeah. Kind of like, so do you identify more as a Seattle Seahawks than a Dallas Cowboy? It's not that I identify more. It's that the Cowboys, for many years, because Tex Ryan was there, he prohibited anybody to send me any invitation. So 10 years later, because I told, I, I told uh, Tex Ryan, I said, right now you have a great team. I said, but, you know, you're going to see how, how fast it's going to disappear your team. I said, you know, you don't value the people. You don't value your players. Because I, I talked to him, and, and he got really pissed off at me that uh, a Mexican, a Mexican-American guy talked to him like that. He was the most powerful guy. And so <clears throat> I never got invited because he didn't let him. And 10 years later, we got invited, and I got a letter. And I remember my son, uh, Matthew, never saw me play. So I decided that I take Matthew to to the Cowboys. And I showed up in the in the party. I showed up and everybody because everybody knew it was a bad thing with with Coach uh, uh Coach I mean uh Tex Ram. And so when I walked into the party it, everybody stopped and you could hear a pen drop. And I went straight to the table, Coach uh, I mean uh Tex Ram and and, and I, I looked at him and I said, Hi Tex, how are you? I said, it's been, what, 10 years? And he just, he, I could see he was really pissed off some there. And then I looked at him and I told him straight, I said, I said, Matthew, this is the kind of people you have to watch out for. I said, this is the man. I said, this is the guy that can stab you in the back. He, and, and I'm in front of everybody, I keep telling this. And he walked out of there. He walked out of there, and I, I, I looked at Leroy Jordan, which one of the best leaders in, in uh, Roger Stomach, and I said, hey, guys, what is this? Are we, is this a party or not? And we stopped partying all night. It was the last time I went, it was the last time I went to see the, uh, the Cowboys, and I never, I never come back. In fact, uh, last year I went to see the stadium, uh, Texas Stadium, and I went to see it, and I want to see it because I heard such a great, uh, you know, such a great thing. And uh, I went, and they charged me thirty dollars to get it to to see the stadium. Really? And, uh, Dang. Yeah, and and I went and saw it and everything, and that's it. I just wanted to see it, nothing else. And so now they send me letters sometimes for the alumni or something, and and I feel really sad that. Such a great team, and and the owners, you know, I, I met him and everything, and I'm sure he knew a little bit about me when he bought it, and so, but they sent me a letter and they asked me, said, you want to, we want you to come, you know, to blah blah blah, and and for some reason the letter, maybe I don't know how to read, but it says there, you know, if you come, we will give you a discount on the fly, and we give you a discount on the hotel, and we give you two tickets free. And I'm, I think I said, what's wrong with these people? Yeah. You know, you look, at, you look at the Raiders. The Raiders fly the whole family. You know, yeah, Denver Broncos do, the Carolina everybody, Panthers, the Falcons. Everybody. And, and, yeah. and when, I, when I get this letter, they tell me they give me a discount to fly. Give me a discount to hotel. But they give me two tickets free. And, and I'm saying, I got to go up there and give them publicity and everything of who really I am. And because there's a lot of fans up there, I go. I just went on a, on a trip to San Antonio, and they say it was for education, and uh, it was a golf tournament. And I went up there, and uh, you know the people in San Antonio I, is, is is where I used to go all the time, and I knew everybody, a lot of people there. I went, and it's part of the education. Well, when I'm there, I donated my whole clubs. My clothes that I play with, uh, the grips, you know, they're special because they have cowboys on it. And yeah. uh, they were my clubs, and, and I said, you know what? 
uh, here I am, and I feel like I want to do something, and, and I don't need the clubs. And somebody, I, I had an auction, and I sold them my clubs for, I think, $600. And I said, I don't want to take this home. I want to make sure we get somebody, maybe a scholarship to somebody that maybe I could re- still reach some people because I still feel that education is the whole idea. And then I, I bought another set because they, when they asked me, I bought another set brand new, and I took that, and I auctioned that too. And so it's fun to be able to help the community because, you know, God has been good to you and the fans have been good to you. And, and I always felt, you know, I, I don't think I ever got into a bad situation with anybody, you know, with the players or they all, if I see anybody from the Cowboys, if I see anybody from the Seahawks when I play, they all, we all respect each other. And they know me. They know me the kind of player I am, the kind of man I am, I keep my word and, and I do it. Money is not everything. And I don't have a lot of money, but I'm happy. I got yeah, my son. And, I mean, I would say just from listening to you talk for the last hour, at the end of the day, when you look back at your career, I mean, you won a Super Bowl, you were a two-time Pro Bowler, I mean, you were a fan favorite in Seattle, did some great things there. You have to be satisfied with what you accomplished. Are you kidding? I'm, I'm so, I mean, I'm so fortunate. Uh, you don't know how much, you know, God has a lot to do with it, put you in the right place and everything, and having faith and believing, you know, because I'm a believer. I mean, I could, I could have missed everything. I could have missed going to UCLA. I could have missed going to the pros. I could have missed. I could have missed a lot of stuff. But it's just the determination that it, what it takes to be able to to make it and work at it. I mean, I worked so hard. You you weren't. I mean, when I was with the Cowboys, I used to lift weights with the linebackers and Randy. I mean, you know, Randy White, and they all. We all. They all. We love each other. Right? They never said, "Oh, Efren, the little kicker," or never, because they respect me. Because you give yourself some respect, and that's all you got. My dad said, "You know, at the end of the day, when you pass away, all you're gonna have is the respect of what you did." And if you do that, you should sleep real well. And every day I sleep real well because, and sometimes, you know, there, there are teams, uh, people come to me and they say, Evan, you, can you believe how much all these kickers are making? Some kickers making over $3 million. If you would have been at that time, you would have, I said, listen to me, very careful. God does not make mistakes. God gave me the talent to play at those times, and I did the best he gave me. And I'm proud of that. It has nothing to do with money. It has nothing to do with anything. It's that a talent that God gives you. God gives you things, and you got to take care of them because that's all it is, nothing else. And a lot of people do not take care of those things. Exactly. And I think you God, I think God put somebody like Tex Schramm in your life to test you and to see how you respond from it. I believe it. I mean, I never had, I never had a hatred toward. I never thought, you know, that I should, I I could have done that. I could have no. You know, God gives you reasons to do things, and and then He gives you the option to do them. And I never been, you know, for some reason, I never been a slave for the dollar. You know, and, and I don't have a lot, but, but I have plenty of life. I have plenty of, I got my son, and I got my family, and I got friends. I can go play, you know, almost every every Monday and every Friday for charity. I, I just play in two, three tournaments, and, and I do the best I can, and, and, and I enjoy my life the way it is. I don't have regrets. I don't have anything to say, you know, if, if I could have just not played those games when I hurt my knee, if I wouldn't have done this, if I, I could have played 20 years. But I never would have been what I am. Yeah. Today. Because if you just change one thing along that way, everything may be completely different. And exactly. it may not be for the better. Exactly. But you, that's, that's what God gives you. Give you the reason to make decisions. They sit on and he believes in you. And I believe in them. And so, so that's what my decision has always been based on, not on greedy, but decisions that people enjoy. Or maybe, you know, when I go and play tournaments, uh, like uh, this Monday, I mean, this Monday I went and played in a nice course here. It's called Friendly Hills. 
And the guys who play with me, they say, you know, uh, we didn't win, but we had a good time. We tried, and, you know, I said, yeah, that's all we need to do. And he said, is there any way we can play next year with you? I said, listen, if God gives us a chance, you let him know, and I'll be happy to play with you again. You know, so so you build something inside of you that it comes and and it's kind of natural. It's not something that you you know. I never believe that I'm. I go to the courses and one of the things I do sometimes, you know, they give you soda, they give you water, they give you all kinds of stuff, and uh, and I pick up some waters and everything or a few sodas. And when I go by, the workers are there. They're working, cutting this or whatever. I ask them, I say, you want something to drink? And they all look at me kind of weird. You know, they say, yeah. I say, here, I got some water. I got some. And and people see that. And they say, you know, I never saw that before. I say, you know, these guys, maybe they, they would like to have a soda. Maybe they would like to have some water. And I said, they work so hard to make it so beautiful. And and I always I always do that. You know, and, and and it's something that you have inside of you. It's not something that you just kind of feel for that. You feel, and I'll tell people, I said, I can talk to anybody. I can talk to a guy who uh, slipped the streets, and I can talk to him. I work for two uh, presidents. Uh, I work for Jack, uh, 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 President Carter and President Bush, and, and I work for Jack Cam, four year in housing. And I did so many things for different lives that God put me in a position to be able to change lives if it's possible. And I still find guys once in a while. Uh, a while back, uh, I went to Seattle. I go to Seattle to play a few tournaments, Kenny Eastley's tournament. And, and so anyway, and I'm yeah, there. We, had, we actually had Kenny on our show a year or two ago to talk about his golf tournament. Yeah, he invited me. Here it is. You know, he invited me to, to go to his uh, inauguration to the Hall of Fame. He's going to be inducted, and so I'm going to probably be there with him on August the 3rd because we become friends. We become anything he wanted to do. He'll call me and say, that's what I'm going to have. I said, count on me. I'm there, Kenny. Oh, you always really need. And so that's what you build. That's what you do. Anyway, I'm up there in Seattle, and this, this cop came over, and he said, Efren, and he said, Mr. Herrera. And I said, oh, I said, did I do something wrong? He said, no. He said, that's the reason I came. You did something good. I said, what? He said, I don't know if you remember, you went to the Tri-Cities, and you talked about, you know, being honest and not stealing and this and that. I said, I still remember it. And, and I remember when you said that, I was, was kind of lost. And it, all of a sudden, things got so clear. And you talk about education. So I went. Now I'm I'm here. I'm with the police department. I got three kids. I got my wife. And and uh, and and I feel that part of it was because you, you know, the way you talked and everything, and and you impressed me. And so sometimes you get paid. You get paid with someone like that, and you say, God, God put me in yeah, that. That's worth more than a million dollars. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, you know, I can tell you stories, all kinds of stories that that uh, another time I went to New York and uh, there's this young man. Well, now he's he's about maybe 20 something years old. He said, Efren, he said, I know you remember me, He said, but I have always followed you. I said, you came to play the Giants. And when you played the Giants, he said, you were there. And we, we was a lot of us in there. And I was the last in the line. And he said, don't push. I'm going to stay here. And I'm going to sign everybody's, everybody's whatever autograph you want. And I said, and, and I thought you were just lying. And I was the last one. And he signed, <laughs> you signed something for me. And uh, I always follow you. He said, I follow your career. You, you had, and he stopped telling me. You know, when you got out, you had like 12 records and blah, blah, blah. And I said, you know, I never kept track of anything. And 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 then he said, in fact, you know, one record is always going to stay there. I said, what? He said, 1981, when you played with Seattle and you were playing in, uh, in, in uh, 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 Green Bay Packers. And you kicked the longest in the NFL that year in the AFC. And I said, really? He said, I didn't know. He said, yeah, it's there. He said, you kicked, I think, he said, I think you kicked a 56-yarder. And, uh, and, and, and that record stayed there because I'm done in 1981. Nobody can break it. He said, the rest of them, there will be break here and there and everything. He said, but I follow you all your career. 
and I know about you, blah, 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 blah. And I just thought, you know, sometimes you don't realize the impact you have on people, on young men, and, and how some of those kids, you know, you can make a difference on them. And, and, and when that happens, I just feel, golly, how precious that God gave me the opportunity to be able to do that. Well, you know? I can tell you this, Efren. I know we've been over an hour, so I'll let you go. I would love to have you back on the show sometime. Um, it's been an absolute honor to have you on. Well, my pleasure. You know, I told you I would do it, and I, I keep my word. Even though yeah, we said and, I mean, me. Ruben Castillo hooked us up, and Ruben said he can still kick your butt in golf. But I want to thank Ruben. <laughs> Ruben asked me to say that before I got off the show. But so All right. I want to thank Ruben for hooking us up because, like I said, it's been an absolute honor to interview you and hear your perspective on life. And anytime you find somebody like yourself that was an athlete that realizes what's important, or anybody, whether athlete or not, it's an absolute privilege to talk to somebody like that. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And uh, if I can help in any sign, you let me know. All right. Thanks a lot, Evan. All right. All right. Take care. Yep, you too. All right, Bye-bye. guys, make sure you check out all of our shows on iHeartRadio, iTunes, TuneIn, Spreaker, Stitcher, wherever you find sports podcasts, you'll find The Grueling Truth. Um, make sure you check out our sponsors, Replenishing Care Technologies and Grid R and Mo. Um, you can go to our website, once again, gruelingtruth.net. Go on there, and you can click on the links. Go straight to those sites. Both are great products, so make sure you check those out. So for Efren Herrera, I'm my good pastor. You've been listening to The Grueling Truth, where the legends speak.